Hello and welcome to a brand new edition of Inside Out on the Road, a show where we focus on individual stocks with in-depth analysis. We deep dive into financial, but we also tell you about the key risks and triggers going forward. Well, let's not waste any time. Let's get straight to the first talk today. My colleague Sonal, she travels to Hyderabad and gets us his very special deep dive on CCL products. The consumption of coffee is rising and in that, the instant coffee market is also picking up. We are in Hyderabad to understand the business of CCL products, instant coffee maker that has more than 900 coffee blends, 400 clients in 90 plus countries. It is on an expansion spree and is planning to increase the capacity from 35,000 tons in FY21 to 77,000 tons in FY25 with an investment of 1,050 crore rupees. Company has products like spray dried coffee, spray dried agglomerated coffee, freeze dried coffee, concentrated liquid coffee, roast and ground coffee, roasted beans and premix, and coffee is sent to clients abroad like Jacobs, there's LMZ, Soluble Coffee, Extract Cafe, and in India to clients like Big Bazaar. Sleepy Owl, Reliance, Spencers, Blue Tokai, to name a few. Now about the revenues. There are some segments here. FY23 revenues were at 2,071 crore rupees, out of which Continental Coffee is 10% of revenues, which has branded and private label. Standalone business is 44% of revenues, which is domestic bulk and export sales. Engon Coffee, which is Vietnam, is 32% of sales and 14% is from Continental Coffee, Switzerland. They get 12% from domestic sales and 88% from overseas sales. And if we look at the category of the last five years, for revenues it has come at 17.6%, EBITDA 13% and PAT CAGR has been at 15%. Margins after being around the 24-25% mark in the last few years have come down to 19%. EBITDA per kg is an important metric to track for the company as well. In terms of key triggers, the focus on the branded business will be key to track followed by market share gains in domestic and global markets. And this will be driven by capacity expansion that the company is planning. But to understand more about the strategy and take a deep dive into the business, let's go ahead and speak to the management. To understand everything about CCL products business, as promised, we have the managing director of the company, Chala Shishan, and he's here to tell us everything about the business and also how does instant coffee reach your home. Well, thank you so much for joining us on CNBC TV 18. It's a special show where we try to understand the business. Uh, so, to the basic question first, uh, can you explain us the value chain of an instant coffee? Uh, where do you stand in that uh, value chain? How is it made? Okay. <laughs> So, uh, broadly speaking, the, the coffee market is divided into two segments. One, you have the roasted ground coffee segment, which is what uh, the coffee shops use. And the second is the instant coffee segment. This is where you have a lot of value addition that takes place. We do additional processing of the coffee to come up with an instant coffee powder that is shelf-stable for at least two years' time. Okay, so uh, when we say that, can you give us an example as to how much quantity leads to how much coffee? Say if you use one kg of uh, coffee seed, how much of an instant coffee is made out of it? So typically we need about two and a half kilos of uh, raw material, that's green coffee, to come up with one kilo of finished product. Okay, so when we are talking about raw materials, um, uh, green uh, beans are of course the raw materials here. What does the sourcing look like? Because you do have uh, factories abroad, you do have production in India. What is the split looking like? So we end up uh, actually importing a lot of our coffees from all over the world. Uh, we buy from, uh, uh, from Brazil, from Mexico, from uh, Ivory Coast, from a lot of countries in Africa. We buy from uh, Indonesia, Vietnam as well, and we also source uh, within uh, India. So we buy from all these locations, we do the value addition at our end, and then we export the coffee. Okay. So how much of your dependence would be on imports? Trying to also understand, say, once coffee prices shoot up, does that cyclicality impact you? So uh, right now about 10% of our coffee is being procured within India because uh, Indian coffee commands a very high premium and if you want to import coffee for the domestic market, there's a 100% duty. So it's not viable to use imported coffee. So for the Indian market, we use Indian coffee 
and if there is any specific customer who is looking for a premium grade or a premium quality, then we use Indian coffee for exports as well. And as far as the cyclicality is concerned, we work in a costless model. Mm. So whatever is the raw material price at a particular point in time, we use that as a base and make an offer to our customer. So uh, even if it's a one-year contract, we do a back-to-back -back contract with our suppliers so that we are covered. So the only way that we grow normally is by increasing our volumes year mm -hmm. on year. That's how we've come. We started with a 3,000 ton factory. By next year, we're going to about 77,000 tons. Okay, and that is one trigger everyone's watching out for as well. So you spoke about uh, 77,000 tons per annum would be your capacity. How much is it as a part of the entire instant coffee market? See, the overall instant coffee market is guesstimated to be around 900,000 tons. Uh, so with the 77,000 tons, we will be the second largest manufacturer in the world next year. Okay. Um, second uh, largest manufacturer. Okay, that's amazing. So, uh, you know, you spoke about uh, how volume growth is something that will lead to growth as well going forward. And pricing is a function of cost plus method. But is pricing competitive? Because we do have a lot of competitors in the instant coffee market as well. Mm -hmm. How do you... Is pricing uh, an advantage for you? How do you look at that dynamic of the business? So for us, our primary advantage is economies of scale. And we have the ability to import raw materials from any origin. So today, Brazil is the largest manufacturer in the world. But they have to use only local raw materials. They can't use raw materials from different origins the way we can. Mm. We have invested in technology and innovation over the last 15, 20 years. So we can actually match products using different grades, different qualities from different parts of the world. So that gives us a competitive edge over everyone else. Okay, interesting. So now we have to understand more about the cost uh, part because you have low cost of production, right? Can you split it up for us? What does it look like in the packaging side? What is it like in transport costs? Uh, how do you ensure that there's low cost of production? You spoke about how um, sourcing is uh, something that makes you competitive. Is there anything else that you focus on as well? So when you actually break it down, costing-wise, about 70% of your product costing is raw material itself. Mm -hmm. Out of the balance, 30%, you have uh, your conversion cost based on your location. You'll have a marginal difference between our conversion cost and other countries' conversion cost. The raw material is the main area where we end up focusing on. Mm -hmm. We ensure that we get the right raw material to get the right finished product. We've been able to match qualities using alternative raw materials mm -hmm. to give options to customers. So that is the flexibility that we have. So our plant also has been designed in a manner, it's been customized in a manner to basically use any type of raw material to get the finished product that we desire. Okay, so when you do have to increase prices on the cost plus method, mm -hmm. uh, there is no impact on demand as such. That stays as is. Because if some, there is a demand for the coffee which is not going to reduce irrespective of the coffee prices. And by virtue of our technology and our ability to service customers, match products, we know that we can service any customer anywhere in the world. So naturally, we have the ability to increase our volumes disproportionate to what the what rate that the market is growing. Okay. So you know, in that 77,000 tons per annum, the capacity that you're increasing, um, there's spray-dried and freeze-dried. First, mm -hmm. I would like to understand the difference here. And I was looking at the margins. Spray-dried, uh, uh, that's going to see a higher capacity addition versus yeah. freeze-dried. Mm -hmm. But freeze-dried margins are higher. Yeah. So can you explain, will that continue to be the mix for you? Uh, so typically what we do is we first expand spray, then we go for freeze dead expansion, then we go back to spray and then freeze again. Okay. So uh, in the recent past, we've completed our spray dried expansion. Now we're going to do our freeze dried expansion in Vietnam, which is going to come online next year around this time. Okay, and what's the difference between the two? So the two qualities are, so spray dried is where you heat up the product to about 200 degrees temperature, 200 to 260 degrees temperature, and you spray the product from a 40 meter high tower. Ah. So there's a heat application. 
Now the aroma and everything which is there in coffee are all volatiles. Mm -hmm. So when you apply so much heat, automatically the volatiles get evaporated. So there's a deterioration in quality that takes place. Okay. But freeze drying is a process where you take the product to minus 60 degrees temperature and then process and make the product. So you lock in the aroma, you lock in the flavor profile, you create a significantly more premium product by doing that. So physical characteristics also will change. I can actually show you yeah. some products mm -hmm. also. For example, this is a freeze-dried coffee. You can see that the structure of granules is very different from a spray-dried coffee. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. This is a spray-dried coffee where you can see it's just plain powder. Oh, okay. So there's a physical difference in uh, the products. Okay, so it's a masterclass not only for investors but every <laughs> coffee lover who loves to brew their own coffee or buy it from CCL products. But thank you for explaining that to us. Um, you know, you spoke about your growth will come in from volumes as well. So, uh, what kind of volume growth are you looking at with the new capacity coming in? When will it see full level of capacity utilization? Mm -hmm. And what happens to return ratios once these new capacities come in because they will not be working with full <coughs> capacity utilization initially, right? Yeah. So, one good thing for us is uh, it takes uh, about 30% utilization itself is enough for a break even for us. Uh, when we have to go in for expansion, we don't directly go in for expansion first. We first start building a market and only when we are confident that we can sell more, we go in for our expansion. So what we did in the last couple of years was we started outsourcing our production to other manufacturers as well. Now that we built up a customer base, we have the confidence that we can go in for further expansion. And first year itself, we are operating at about 50% utilization. And we're looking at increasing our overall volumes at a 20% year on year. So we are confident that our ratios will definitely, initially, obviously the ratios will uh, deteriorate. But in the next couple of years, automatically that will improve significantly. Okay. So, you know, I have a lot more questions for you. But since you've showed me the coffees, I think we should have one cup and then continue okay. with this conversation. Sure. <laughs> Okay, so you're making me some coffee? Yes, so both have been pre-configured, so you just have to tap this and you'll get your coffee. Should I just yeah. tap? Just tap it down. Alright, so while we're at it and we pick this uh, nice looking coffee, you know, uh, B2B versus B2C. There has been a change in your idea as well and you're focusing on B2C a lot more. What will the mix look like going forward? How are you focusing on marketing on this one? So the B2C segment is something that we were quite interested in because that's where the valuation of a company unlock actually takes place and building a brand is not an easy task. So we started this as an experiment about six, seven years ago. Uh, then we reached a certain minimum scale that we felt that we should professionalize and take it forward. And after professionalizing, our volume started growing as well. So that helped us come up with a, a long-term vision or a strategy where we want to transition from a B2B to B2C. So this transition will take a couple of years, of course. But the idea is that maybe over the next uh, 7 to 10 years, we want to have at least 50% of our business coming from B2C segment. Okay. So, uh, when we talk about that, it's still it's 10% of your business right now. Yeah. still loss making, right? Mm -hmm. So no, we've broken even actually. Okay, you've broken yeah. even now. So, mm -hmm. uh, what will the growth on the profitability look like there? What is the volume growth outlook here? Mm -hmm. You did give us a sense of what it will be as a percentage of mm -hmm. overall revenues. Yeah. down the line. Mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of profitability, what will it look like? So, uh, actually the target that we've given our team is that focus only on volume growth, profitability, ensure that there are no losses. So, uh, the reason for this is we know that our core business is anyway growing at a very good healthy pace and we can sustain this uh, B2C business as well without it actually contributing to the bottom line. So that's the reason the team has clarity. They, they know that they're supposed to focus only on volume growth, at least for the next uh, couple of years. 
So eventually when it starts contributing, uh, when our B2C uh, sales also start reducing after a certain point in time, that's when the B2C will start stepping in as well. Okay, so what are some changes that you're planning to do in that case? Will you uh, increase your market fees, distribution, will it mean more expenditure on that side? So yes, we are increasing our distribution reach, not only in India, we're looking at launching our products in different parts of the world as well. So we've acquired this brand uh, called Rocket Fuel and Burkhard in the UK. So with our brand presence over there also, we are slowly transitioning from the B2B to B2C. Okay, so um, when we talk about those changes as well, um, uh, you know this question has been asked to you a lot of times, but are you looking at a new FMCG head there? Will it be a separate entity altogether? Will you look at listing it as well? Because you spoke about get this business getting higher valuation. So uh, initially we thought we will separate it, but today we are actually in the process of demerging and merging it with the parent company. Mm -hmm. We are consolidating the entire coffee business under one roof. So from uh, next month onwards especially, the entire B2B and B2C verticals will be under the same uh, company. Okay, so no plans of demerging, uh, you know, looking at it as a separate vertical and listing it or anything? No. Not and not, not uh, you're looking at a separate head, FMCG head for that business? No, so our CEO right now who is in place was brought in for the specific purpose. So he's building his team as well. So he's bringing in a lot of new people for uh, the international market as well, for the new areas that we're going to be launching our products also. Okay. So, you know, you are talking about focusing on the B2C business. You spoke about this segment as well. What will EBITDA per kg look like? I'm not asking about margins because you have told us yeah. in the past EBITDA per kg is important to track. Mm -hmm. And what would be a possible downside risk to all the uh, guidance or projections that you have in place? So, uh, with respect to our core business, which is now like what 99% is coffee, less than 1%, less than half a percent of what we do, will be these niche products and categories. So, uh, in the near future, we don't really see any significant change as such. We are looking at uh, uh, growing this B2B segment much more aggressively as well. So, we are confident we can sustain our margins as well. In fact, if we have to fill our capacities, if we have to grow by a 40% year on year, we have the ability to do that is if we sacrifice on our margins. Mm -hmm. But we are not doing that. We want to grow in a more sustainable manner. Okay, 20% volume growth with sustainable margins yeah. is what you're looking at. Okay, it was a strong interview that we had, a conversation that is. Thank you so much for joining us today and explaining to us everything about CCL products mm -hmm. and the outlook as well. Thanks a lot. Thank you. <laughs> okay, with that, uh, it's a wrap on this segment and with that, it's back to you in the studio. All right, that was the deep dive into CCL products. But time to slip into a short break. We'll come back with another interesting stock that we're going to explain to you. Unipass, that's the stock on our Swatlight segment. You don't go anywhere. <laughs>